Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Particular Baptist Podcast. I am your host, Daniel Vincent. You can find us and other podcasts at reformpodcast.com. Also, check out our blog at theparticularbaptist.net. And if you're watching on YouTube or Twitter, follow us on Twitter if you haven't already. And if you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and the bell to be notified if there are any new videos. And I want to thank our patrons again, uh, Stephen and, and David and others who graciously support us on a monthly basis. We want to thank you for your support for our ministry, and we hope that you continue to benefit from the work that we do. All right, so this is part two of our series on Jeff's book, uh, The Revealed God, an Introduction to Biblical Classical Theism. We are looking at this from a historical perspective today. Last week was primarily theological, but Jeff did not just deal with the doctrine of God on a theological issue. He also attempted to do so from a historical issue. And we're going to be focusing on that today on areas that we think that are important uh, to bring out. There were some there was some feedback from the episode last week that we want to address in passing. Um, and Andrew, I'll let you go first with the one you wanted to bring up. Sure. One comment. Excuse me. One commenter uh, had said that we were implying that if you didn't hold to Thomistic metaphysics, then you can't be saved. And I want to stress as clearly as I can that that's not what we're saying, and for two reasons. One, because this isn't Thomistic metaphysics. This is the metaphysics of historic Christianity. Mm -hmm. This is the metaphysics that our Reformed forefathers embraced, uh, the early church over a thousand years before Thomas Aquinas. And so he really had nothing to do with inventing the metaphysics uh, that we're talking about today. It's biblical metaphysics. Uh, so that's the first reason why that's not true. The second reason why it's not true is because the things that we're discussing can be held and believed with a simple faith. In other words, you don't have to be able to articulate the things that we're talking about in any great amount of depth or anything. You can believe with simplicity that, okay, yeah, God is eternal. He doesn't change. He is the ultimate. He is self-sufficient. He doesn't lack anything. He doesn't gain anything from creatures. All these things can be believed with a simple faith without being able to understand uh, how these things logically cohere together. The issue comes into play when you start to push against these things are to teach things that either explicitly or implicitly undermine these cardinal truths of the faith. And that's where Jeff's book runs an issue, especially by way of implication. Um, uh, he undermines the, the sufficiency of the divine essence in creating and uh, providentially governing the world. Uh, and in that way, pushes against uh, these cardinal truths. And so there's a great danger here when he does that. So, so that's the, the issue is that these things are being undermined and pushed against. In, in that respect, it's a matter of life of, or death. Uh, though we might be confused about them for a time, um, you can't deny them outright and consistently and continue to believe in the God of the Bible, the God that Scripture holds forth before us. Yep. So hopefully that makes it clear what we are saying by that. Yep, we're confessing the faith that has been once given to the saints, as Scripture says, and it's not tied to any one man. It's it's They're just pulling from that faith that's been given to them, and they're receiving it, expounding upon it, and passing it down. And that's really what we're focused on here. Um, and then I had a comment as well. Uh, David Coleman uh, he is a Unitarian. He was listening to the show last week, and he's been very active in commenting on our YouTube channel. But he made, uh, he said this, he said, properties in God of no real distinction according to the doctrine of divine simplicity. What you're describing are not properties. They're actually relations, and the relations are wholly identical with the essence. Therefore, there is no principle of distinction in the relations because there is no distinction between the relations and the essence. So we'll actually be addressing that today. Uh, at least indirectly, as we get into some of the historical data surrounding West, uh, the post-Reformed, Westminster, uh, the particular Baptists. And we'll see very quickly that the doctrine of divine simplicity certainly has no problem using the term properties as it relates to uh, relations in God. So 
I just want to point that out. So as we go along, hopefully those kind of things will be cleared up. But as we're talking about history, uh, we realize history is important, right? It's not our ultimate authority when it comes to Christian doctrine. It's something that is helpful. It can provide us a guide. God has certainly promised to lead his people in all truth. So that faith that we mentioned that was delivered to the saints will not be completely squashed if it is twisted, if people come and try to completely get rid of it. it there will be a remnant where God's truth will be there. So we will be able to find God's truth, the scriptures, the, the proper theology uh, throughout history. And we can learn from what men did. We can learn from the writings of godly men who have put these things down for our learning. And we live in a day and age where we can pull up great works in an instant. We can go to Logos and do searches on words and concepts and topics and be able to find things quickly. We, we live in a very blessed time to be able to do that and we can learn from these men to see how they work through difficult issues like the doctrine of God, like uh, talking about God's operations and how that is discussed in relation to his essence, as we talked about last week. So we can learn from these things. And I think it's been, you know it's helpful. And I think Jeff sees history as helpful too because he spends quite a bit of time on history on church history and history of philosophy. So I think he sees it as very helpful in the discussion too. But Jeff attempts to use history, uh, at least in the post reform sense, to show at the very least that there is a diversity of views among the post reform as it relates to simplicity. Um, and I I hope what we can do, and I think what we'll be able to do, is, is demonstrate that his denial of operational simplicity uh, and that the misrepresentations that we'll present that are from his book historically are without merit and utterly barren in the way he presents his historical speaking. So especially when we get to the post-reform side and looking at what did the reform understand from a professional perspective, is if you spend quite a bit of time on that, um, I think that we'll be able to demonstrate that. Because really what Jeff is, I think, trying to do is he's trying to create reasonable doubt in the tradition so that his view is somehow accommodated, right? Or it can or it can take on a variety of views. There's not one stream of orthodoxy. There can be multiple views within the same category of simplicity passability, etc., that mean different things, and we want to demonstrate that that's not the case, and I think we'll be able to, to show that today, that there was a view that was held, um, and we can see that stream. So, yeah, of course. Uh, I think it's a broader historical framework. Let's go ahead. Yeah, uh, but before I do that, uh, I don't know if you, you've seen, I, I think your mic got disconnected, Dan, was the quality. Of oh, the can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, I've been okay. able to hear you the whole time. It's just the the quality. Was, okay, thank the quality you. Dropped. So, yeah, it's good now. Anyways, uh, so yeah, like Dan said, uh, we wanted to start by talking about the broader historical framework that he lays out in his book, and then we're going to dive into some specific figures that he misrepresents uh, along the way. So the top subtitle of the book is an introduction to biblical classical theism. We've talked about this a little bit in the last episode, but as far as I know, this is his own term, biblical classical theism, and it reflects his attempt to push his ideas as if they were an alternative tradition of classical theism over and against what he calls philosophical classical theism, which is really just classical theism, and it's the view that we espouse here of the particular Baptist. In his intro, he gives us some of the heroes of each of these two traditions, his biblical classical theism and our philosophical classical theism. And, our, and on our side, he gives us this list, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Pseudo-Dionysius, John of Damascus, Boethius, Eriugena, Peter Lombard, and Thomas Aquinas. So that's our list. On his side, he gives his own heroes, uh, and he gives a noble tradition of Tertullian, Calvin and Charles Hodge. That's it. Just those those three men are the only ones here that he lists. I hope that's already made some of you raise your eyebrows. The three on his side are strange bedfellows indeed. And Tertullian is really the only one old enough, I'd say, to be labeled classical in 
uh, the traditional use of that term. And he's also the most radically different from the other theologians that he mentions. Charles Hodge is a 19th century theologian, so he's, he's a modern theologian. And even for Calvin, mm -hmm. three-fourths of church history had already passed by his day. He's, of course, a representative of Reformed theology. When we talk about classical theology, we're usually talking about something that's older than Reformed theology, that Reformed theology inherits but does not originate. And so if it just started with Calvin, it would already be too old, I would say, to be considered classical theology. So if, if these are his biblical classical theists, as he calls them, it all really stands or falls with Turden of whether or not is you can even be called a classical theism in any sense of the word. And on the side of what he calls, again, philosophical classical theism, there are not only some strange bedfellows as well, but I can't help but note how the list only includes the men that his audience would probably either have issues with or not be familiar with. Why leave out a philosophical classical theist as significant as Augustine from his list? Or how about Athanasius? How about Ambrose? These men were certainly what he would call philosophical classical theists and are more significant than quite a few of the people that he includes in the list for our tradition. Uh, yet they're left out. And they're also figures that most Reformed people would agree are generally good. Likewise, if he's showed that he's willing to go all the way to the 19th century for his list of biblical classical theists, why does he stop right at the Middle Ages with Thomas Aquinas for philosophical classical theists? If he includes Calvin on his side, it's curious that he doesn't mention a Turidan, a Theodore Beza, a Stephen Sharnock, or Nehemiah Cox and John Gill on our side. So these parallel lists seem suspiciously imbalanced uh, from my perspective. The impression we're left with is that philosophical classical theism is that view of that old, those old medieval Catholics like Aquinas and Lombard, and also those unorthodox men like Origen and Clement of Alexandria. Whereas if you were, if you were to stick to reform men like Calvin and Hodge, Jeff's view is what you'd get. That's the impression that this lit parallel list gives, and it's a completely inaccurate one, as we will show as we go through it. But the situation gets worse because even the guys that he says are on his side of the biblical classical theist camp don't fit the criteria that he gives. I'll grant him Charles Hodge for the sake of argument. I won't contest that because I have to be fair that I haven't read too much of Charles Hodge. And so I can't say whether or not that he holds to all of the distinctives that Jeff gives. Um, and I will say, too, that the quotes that Jeff provides from Hodge do seem to indicate that he had at least similar issues to Jeff, even if maybe he didn't hold to all the distinctions. I, I just can't speak for that. So I won't challenge him on Hodge, but I will challenge him on Calvin and Tertullian. Tertullian is actually an interesting person that you'd want to have on your side of this debate because he says some notoriously confusing things about the doctrine of God uh, from either perspective. So much so that many accuse him of believing that God had a body and that the Son and Spirit were parts of that body. Uh, nevertheless, I actually do agree with Calvin that Tertullian is probably misunderstood on that point and that it's a matter of him defining terms differently than later generations would based on some more orthodox things that Tertullian says elsewhere. But in any case, Tertullian certainly didn't hold to all the distinctives that Jeff lays out for biblical classical theism one of which is uh, asserting that there are emotions in God, that, he's, uh, that he has what Jeff calls self-mobility. Well, on the contrary, Tertullian says the following when he's discussing the origin of the term theos, which is the Greek name for God. He says, quote, Some affirm that the gods, i.e. theoi, were so called because the verbs theain and seistai signify to run and to be moved. This term, then, is not indicative of any majesty, for it is derived from running and motion, not from any dominion of Godhead. But inasmuch as the supreme God whom we worship is also de designated Theos, without, however, the appearance of any course or motion in him, because he is not visible to anyone, it is clear that the word must have had some other derivation, and that the property of divinity innate in himself must have been discovered." End quote. 
Note how Tertullian simply assumes that any idea of running or motion are unfitting of majesty. They don't express any majesty in them, and therefore they're unfitting for the God who does not need to step off his throne for one moment to rule and govern creation with perfect dominion. He dismisses offhand that any idea of movement could be behind the name of God because of the nature of who he is as invisible, as the invisible and majestic deity. He doesn't even have a visible form where you could see motion in it, let alone have it. Jeff's view doesn't even enter into his mind as a possibility worthy to consider of God for Tertullian. The only time Jeff does quote Tertullian as holding to his distinctives is when he shows his pessimism about the worth of philosophy, like his famous, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem quote that's repeated often from Tertullian. So really, this commonality with Jeff's position isn't about his doctrine of theism at all. It's about epistemology and skepticism towards philosophy, which is, of course, a, a non sequitur. Somebody can be pessimistic uh, about philosophy, but also not think that there's motion in God or that he has a simple essence and then accidents or, or, or free acts and times that are different and separate from the essence. Those are co two completely different things. And Jeff makes indeed no effort to show that Tertullian held to the other distinctives. Namely, Jeff's conception of God as personal in a kind of reciprocal give and take relationship way, not what we would mean by personal. Uh, his separation of God from his working, uh, the idea of motion in God and the like, all of those distinctives that Jeff lays out in his book, he doesn't demonstrate that Tertullian hold to any of them and he doesn't even try. And the reality is he can't because Tertullian didn't hold those things. It seems really that it's all about his skepticism towards philosophy, which if that was the case, uh, he shouldn't have even included the scholastic Peter Lombard in our camp who said, quote, the mystery of faith is free from philosophical arguments. That's from book three of his institutes. I think that's at least as powerful as Tertullian's quote, and if it's not paraded around as much, it's probably just because it's not as well known as Tertullian's quote. But he was certainly, and Jeff acknowledges by putting him in our list, a philosophical classical theist, right? So it shows you that that that's an in-house debate how much room we should have for uh, secular philosophy and the things of Scripture that don't determine at all ultimately whether or not you hold to the classical doctrine of God. And so it should not be treated as a criteria or equated with the idea um, that somebody holds to Jeff's version of, of biblical classical theism. So the only truly classical theologian in my, in my book is, is out here. Tertullian is the only one who's old enough, and he clearly does not fit in Jeff's camp. But Jeff can't have Calvin either. He again makes no attempt to prove that Calvin held to his distinctives, and I, I suspect that this is again mostly driven by Calvin's skepticism of philosophy, as well as his reluctance to get into what he referred to as too much speculation in the doctrine of God. But silence, of course, is in agreement with, with Jeff by any stretch of the imagination, and Calvin clearly positions himself in his institutes as generally in line with the views of Augustine and others when it came to the doctrine of God. And Augustine certainly is not in Jeff's biblical classical theist uh, camp. He doesn't hold to the distinctives that Jeff lays out. He's in our camp. Uh, so I would say that this area is sim was simply not Calvin's forte, but he willingly aligns himself with those who would have been in our camp and so does not support the view of Jeff at all. And if Calvin was against our view, it's really inexplicable why Virtually all his followers from the Reformed tradition so overwhelmingly shared our view. So at the end of the day, all Jeff has is perhaps Hodge from his already small list of three men that he gives us at the beginning of the book. So his biblical classical theism doesn't exactly have a long pedigree or a long standing tradition. It's certainly not a classical tradition at all. Therefore, the title of his book is a complete misnomer. It's really neither classical nor biblical, uh, the latter of which we, of course, demonstrated in our last episode. Yeah, it's interesting <clears throat> You, when you start to look at, and we'll see this when we get to the post-reform section, how the 
characters that or the historical figures that he tries to use for his side get whittled down really fast. Yep. He, he might he maybe might have one or two, um, not as many as he thinks he does um, in in terms of what supports his you know, the theological position, or even if it does support his theological position, it, you know, at the very least, it might even be doubtful. You know, you, you might be able to just say, well, maybe they did, but it, yeah. there's, it's very hard to say definitively if they did or not. So we'll see that again as we get to the post reform. The, the list of characters gets whittled down pretty fast when you really dig into the historical data, not just make blanket historical assertions about individuals or yeah. pull quotes here and there that appear to fit your position. Yeah. And again, one of his central purposes of this book was to say that, hey, we should stop fighting. Both of our views fit within the tradition, right? There's room for disagreement, which I will say as a general rule of thumb, it's usually the the people who are teaching heresy who who say those things. That's what Arius said in um, the fourth century as well. It's always the people who want to play along. I shouldn't say always, but often it's the people who just want to get along and get along. You say things like that, but when even his list of figures in his introduction don't bear the test of scrutiny besides maybe one of them, and he's not a classical theist at all, <laughs> then yeah, you, you can tell that we've, we haven't gone out. We haven't gotten to a very good start here. Right. So anyways, I also wanted to make a, a brief comment on his overall uh, historiographical method. So that's the way he talks about history, right? Uh, as, um, you know, as an unfolding of, of unit ideas. I want to talk a little bit about that before going further. He depends heavily on Arthur Lovejoy and his great chain of being when discussing the history of ideas of classical theism. Now, Arthur Lovejoy, if you don't know, uh, he's credited by many as the father of the history of ideas in the 20th century. And he was a committed evolutionist and viewed much of Christian theology as a blending of Greek pagan thought and veneration of Christ. So needless to say, he was not approaching his study from what we would recognize as a Christian perspective. And even he admits that the scope of his inquiry was so large that his analysis would almost be doomed to partial failure because he has to incorporate the teachings of many other di disciplines uh, as a non-specialist in them. You can't be a specialist in all the fields you need to consider when forming his uh, history of ideas, which involves literature, philosophers, and not just some of them. He says you need to consider all of it, all the way from Plato up to Spinoza, basically, which that probably requires a little bit too close to omniscience to, to really be viable to pull off. But anyways, uh, that's the backdrop of a lot of Jeff's historical analysis, which is why we should really take it with a grain of salt in general, in addition to the specific examples that we're going to cover today. But with that, I guess, uh, unless Dan, you had something, uh, I will start with going into a specific figure that I think he misrepresents. Go right ahead. Uh, starting with the early church, Gregory of Nyssa. Mm -hmm. Jeff asserts on page 180 that Gregory, as well as, as well as Basil of Caesarea, but I'm going to focus on Gregory. Uh, he, he says that he didn't believe in the identity of the divine attributes, but instead taught that they were only inseparable, but really distinct in God. That's what Jeff says that Gregory taught. But that's not correct, and one example is enough to show this. When Gregory is defending the quality of the deity of father and son against uh, Eunomius, uh, in his work, Contra Eunomian, and he was an Arian of his day, uh, Gregory says the following, quote, For who does not know that, to be exact, simplicity in the case of the Holy Trinity admits of no degrees. In this case, there's no mixture or conflux of qualities to think of. We comprehend a potency without parts and composition. How then, and on what grounds, could anyone perceive there are any differences of less and more? For he who marks differences there must perforce think of an incidence of certain qualities in the subject. He must, in fact, have perceived differences in largeness and smallness therein to have introduced this conception of quantity into the question. Or he must posit abundance or diminution in the matter of goodness, strength, wisdom, or of anything else that can with reverence be associated with God. And neither way will he escape the idea of composition. Nothing which possesses wisdom or power or any other good, not as an external gift, 
but rooted in its nature, can suffer diminution in it. So that if anyone says that he detects beings greater and smaller in the divine nature, which, as an aside, that's what the Arians were trying to do. They are trying to say, oh, the Father's a greater God and the Son's a lesser God. Gregory goes on, if anyone tries to do this in the divine nature, he's unconsciously establishing a composite and heterogeneous deity and thinking of the subject as one thing and the quality to share in which constitutes as good, that which was not so before, as another. And here's the kicker. If he had been thinking of a being really single and absolutely one, identical with goodness rather than possessing it, he would not be able to count a greater and a less in it at all. So that if he acknowledges the supreme being to be single and homogenous, let him grant that it is bound up with this universal attribute of simplicity and infinitude. If, on the other hand, he divides and estranges the beings from each other, conceiving that of the only begotten as another than the fathers, and that of the spirit as another than the only begotten, with a more or less in each case, let him be exposed now as granting simplicity in appearance only to the deity, but in reality proving the composite in him. Yep. And uh, I want to just mention the, the last part there. Let him be exposed now as granting simplicity appearance only in the deity, but in reality proving the composite in him. So Gregory is pointing out here that if one introduces parts in God, they're saying he's saying that they don't really believe in simplicity. They only give the appearance that they believe in it. Right. That's right. And that's one thing that one of the themes that we want to bring out clearly today, as we're looking at this from Jeff's perspective, that he is not confessing simplicity. He wants to that's use right. the classical language of simplicity, mutability, and passability. Those are the three big ones that he uses that, uh, you know, he says are kind of the, the core, quote unquote, attributes. But he continuously undermines them at every turn. Again, we talked about this last week, how he's introducing compositeness in god you know I, I believe in simplicity but god's at extra works are not identical with his essence i believe in simplicity but the persons are not identical with the essence etc so it's he says i want to have these classical terms and i believe in them but i'm going to undermine their meaning and every time i'm just going to completely gut them of what they actually mean historically speaking and so you can see Gregory anticipating that kind of thought. Like, yeah, these guys might say that they believe in this, but they're really not believing in it because what they're saying does not line up with the definitions that they are claiming to hold to. That's absolutely right. And I want to really stress this because I think it's so important when it reveals a lot about early church history. Mm -hmm. uh, when Gregory is dealing with the Arians here, his whole argument uh, is about the equality of the Father, Son, and Spirit. It's all grounded on a high doctrine of divine simplicity. Yep. That's the backdrop for how they dealt with the Arians. Uh, and that this doctrine asserts the identity of the divine attributes with the deity, not just in perfect unity with each other. And it's because of this identity of God with his attributes that none of the three whom Scripture calls God can be greater or lesser than one another. That's Gregory's argument. The son could not have a lesser goodness than the father, for example, because goodness isn't something that God has. He simply is mm -hmm. his goodness and its infinite fullness. As uh, Gregory says, it's all bound up in the universal attribute of simplicity and infinitude. Uh, so that to be God is to be identical with that simplicity and infinitude, the, that infinite goodness, that infinite wisdom and all the rest. And obviously it should go without saying that if God's identical to his goodness and identical to his power, etc., and that's all just his simplicity and infinitude, then they're all identical with one another, too, by the law of identity. That's simply what identity means. If A equals B and B equals C by identity, then A equals C as well. We learned that in school. We're not dealing with relative properties like fatherhood or sonhood here, which speaks of how God subsists and not what is subsisting. These qualities of goodness, power, wisdom, and the like, they're describing the what, the Godhead, what's his nature that all three persons are by way of identity. And whenever we deal with the question of what, the law of identity is inescapable. Anything else is simply a contradiction in terms.
So Gregory is here very clearly asserting that all of God's attributes are identical with himself. And then, of course, necessarily that means they're all identical with each other. Otherwise, we're just speaking gobbledygook. Mm -hmm. So where did Jeff get this idea from that Gregory taught otherwise? Well, in, in this case, he only references a secondary source in his work. So he's not pulling it from Gregory directly, it doesn't seem. But the root issue is a misunderstanding of Gregory and Basil's assertions that speak of the attributes as distinct in our minds without understanding that they were not teaching that they're really distinct in God, as the quotation from Gregory above clearly shows. Bovink himself, Bovink himself talks about this in volume two of his Reformed Dogmatics. And so I'll simply quote what he says about it and thus kill two birds with one stone, since Jeff misrepresents Bovink on this point as well on page 267. So here's what Bovink says. Quote, on the one hand, they, Gregory and Basil, maintain that the attributes did not differ in substance, since God is simple and transcends all composition, like we just said. Yet, on the other, they do not differ only in name. Avoiding both extremes, they judge that the names of God differ in thought, that in our mind, notice he doesn't say in God's mind, in our mind, we have different ideas, thoughts, and considerations of the same divine being. Therefore, with reference to the different attributes, such as goodness, wisdom, etc., we do not just use different names, but in that connection, really entertain different ideas. Notice again, we entertain different ideas, not God. No single name expresses God's being with full adequacy, but there are nevertheless many names, properties, and fitting honors by which some characteristic of God becomes known to us. Gregory of Nyssa even spoke of the essence, usia, of God as the subject and of different qualities or properties pertaining to that essence. Accordingly, the ideas that we associate with the names of God are distinct from each other. It was therefore considered an error to use the names of God interchangeably or to confuse them, end quote. So whenever you see proof text from Bovink or from Gregory or Basil on this issue, on the distinction of attributes, hopefully it's clear as can be that they're not talking about them really being distinct from one another within God, but rather they're distinct in our minds and in our ideas. And this ties back closely to our discussion of analogy that we had in our last episode, how that because none of our language can comprehensively describe God or express him as he is, we have to multiply terms and ideas to express him to the fullest of our abilities. And so we say that God unfolds his providence and his wisdom. He provides for us in his goodness. He magnifies himself in his holiness before us. And these different attributes communicate different things to our minds in each of those statements. And they're not to be confounded with each other. But we know that in God, the wisdom behind his providence is also his goodness. His holiness, even the act of his perfect simplicity by which he is all that he is and does all that he does, even though we can only comprehend that simplicity in fragments, in, as it were, scattered wavelengths of light passing through a glass prism, despite having a single source. And so, to put it in yet another way, the attributes are really distinct in our ectypal theology, but they are one in its archetypal mind. Yep. And, and that's really how to look at it from our perspective. Those things are distinct because that's all we can do. We're not finite. We're, we're not infinite beings. We can only think in categories of parts. So we have to speak in those separate categories, but we just can't impose that back to God. And that it seems so simple, but that's the mistake people use. They use univocal language all the time. That's what happened that's right. uh, throughout the history of the church. Always trying to make God creature in some way. And it yep. ends up derailing the entire theological system. That's right. But in God, it's not so. In God, yes. all these attributes are identical one with another. I've heard some people say, it's like, oh, well, so we can tell the difference, but God can't? It's like, well, God knows that you are discerning the difference in theology. Right. God also knows that he is, um, from the relative consideration of his ad extra decree, that he's manifesting himself as wise in this case, manifesting himself as merciful in this case. And on the cross, the greatest revelation of himself, he's manifesting himself as merciful, just, good, loving, because the greater the revelation of himself, the more you see that those attributes really are one within yep. himself. So he, he, he understands and knows the distinction of how he manifests himself, 
but he doesn't know a distinction within those attributes inside himself because there is no distinction. God doesn't know something false. So in himself, mm -hmm. they're one. They're only different when we talk about them or they're different in how he reveals himself under different relative considerations. Yep. And as we dive here into the Westminster divines in the, the high reform period, you're going to see this language come up again as it relates to the identity view. Cause you know, we're going to see in Jeff's book, chapter 14, and there might be other places, but chapter 14 of Jeff's book in particular is where he really goes into uh, the high reform time, the Westminster assembly and some of those historical assertions there. Uh, and he, presents those who formulated the Westminster Confession as, or at least the Westminster Assembly, as divided on theology proper. He really does try to do that, uh, and we'll see that's not the case. So what I want to do first is go through, just at a high level, some of the theology proper uh, of that stream of orthodoxy that you saw kind of in the, the pre-Reformation, or I guess early Reformation period, high Reformation period. So I'll be kind of pulling some quotes from all over the place here. But I want to start off with the Westminster Confession of Faith. The theology proper of Westminster was consistent with classical understandings of theism, which included the early particular Baptists who came before the assembly. Sorry, Presbyterian brethren, we love you, but Baptists have been doing confessions before it was cool. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> just throwing that out there. We love you guys, but just, just saying, just saying. Um, okay, so I'm going to be quoting from the Westminster here. This is the 1646, chapter 2, paragraph 1. There is but one only living and true God who is infinite in being a perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will for his own glory, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and withal, most just and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. So very early on in the confession, we have explicit discussion about God's essence, and an early confession in uh, early on in this paragraph, without body parts of passage, so God is not creature, God does not have parts, and he's not moved upon anything outside of himself. Very clear up front. Okay. Now, stepping back in history a little bit, and we'll see this more when we get to the particular Baptist, but William Ames, who is Puritan uh, theologian who came decades before the Westminster Assembly convened and, and before this confession was written, he was even writing a about these things and his marrow of theology. I highly encourage you to get it. It's a very helpful uh, discussion guide out of early systematic theology. But this is from the marrow of theology, page 16, Kindle edition. Quote, these attributes in God are most pure and simple act. Hence, the nature of the divine attributes may be rightly explained by these propositions as so many consecretaries, consequences, or conclusions. So Ames is Believing in the identity account here. All the attributes are one in God. There's no diversity in God as it relates to his attributes. So even before the Westminster, you're seeing this early confession in the Reformed tradition as it relates to God's attributes. The Belgic Confession of Faith, which is a 16th century confession. We all believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that there is a single and simple spiritual being whom we call God. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, and I'm jumping all over the place here. I'm jumping to different topics, different people. I just want us to see, you know, not just looking at Westminster and the form, but just this is the language of the church in general. Okay. This is Thomas Aquinas I'm replying to the objections um, of question three, article seven of the Summa. Uh, Aquinas quotes Augustine. So here's Augustine is, or uh, Aquinas is not stopping at Aquinas, right? He's going back. Mm -hmm. He's going back even earlier. Hundreds. Not inventing a metaphysic. Yes. Not, he's not being original at all uh, in relation to this. So he's quoting Augustine. He says from Augustine, on the contrary, Augustine says, God is truly and absolutely simple. Okay. 
And then you see Ames, who's following Aquinas, who's following Augustine. So again, you see this long tradition of language being used. And then, of course, you have Francis Chanel, who was a Westminster um, divine, and we'll dive into him more as we look at some of these other guys. But he's this is from his book, The Divine Triunity, page 116. He says, the essential attributes do not differ from one another because the essence of God is single, uncompounded, undivided, indivisible. And one of these attributes both essentially predicate of the other. The power, wisdom, goodness of God are single, eternal, immutable, infinite. I don't know how much clearer you can get than that. And this is a Westminster divine. So this is the theology of the Westminster Assembly. This is the theology of the Westminster Standards. Okay. Um, William Ames, again, talking about the persons of the Trinity being distinguished among each other. This is page 22 of his The Mirror of Theology. They are distinguished among themselves as relatives by certain relative properties. So as one cannot be another, yet they are together in nature. Neither can they be said to be former or latter, but in order of beginning and manner of subsisting. So he's using language from the Athanasian Creed, right? One is not greater. One has not come before. One has not come after. Confessing the faith given to the saints. And to David Coleman's point, that simplicity does not incorporate personal properties this proves that to be absolute garbage as it relates to simplicity they used relative properties and they understood those uh, to be part of the consideration of the doctrine of divine simplicity jeremiah burroughs another westminster divine he talks about the attributes as well this is from his in exposition with practical observations continued upon the 11th 12th and 13th chapters of the prophecy of hosea 273 to 274. Uh, it's funny, some obscure minor prophet he's pulling these great doctrines out of. It's just throughout scripture. I mean, they're not going to, you know, any of these big proof texts. It's just as they're expounding scripture, they're seeing these implications even in the minor prophets. Absolutely. The Jeremiah Burroughs, he said, quote, all that is in all that is said of God is God himself, and therefore it is all but one being in God. It doth appear diverse to us wisdom mercy justice power life holiness and faithfulness appears many things to us but in god all is but one excellency again very clear this was not controversial among the westminster assembly in terms of at least in terms of those who were formulating the doctrine of these standards this was what they uh, believe Westminster larger catechism. How many persons are there in the Godhead? Answer: There be three persons in the Godhead: the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are all one true eternal God, the the same in substance, equal in power and glory, although distinguished by their personal properties. There's that term again. And then looking at the next question, question ten: What are the personal properties of the three persons of the Godhead? Answer, it is proper to the Father to beget the Son, and to the Son to be begotten of the Father, and to the Holy Ghost to proceed from the Father and the Son from all eternity. And same language that Ames is using. This and this is the consistent confession of the Westminsterians, the Reformed, and the Church. The, they're just using that same language. Um, this next quote is from William Ames, and this is actually related to to the topic that dress or uh, that Jeff is addressing in his book on operational simplicity, Ames deals with this directly. This is uh, from Ismero again. He says that affecting, working, or acting of God being actively taken as they are in God, acting not really diverse from God Himself, for no composition or mutation of power and act can have place in the most simple and immutable nature of God. Yet it addeth a certain relation of God to a real effect so god's works are not distinct from his essence they are the essence and yeah, this is very early in the reformed tradition that we're seeing this being discussed now looking at richard Mueller, so that i was doing a primary source material now we're looking at secondary source material and the combination of those two can be very helpful but this is from Mueller's dictionary of latin and greek theological terms in the section titled simplicitas so dealing with simplicity the simplicitas dei, according to which God is understood to be absolutely free of any and all composition, includes not merely physical, but also rational or logical composition. God, in contrast to the lesser simplicity of angels and souls, is most simple actuality. Actus simplicitus. Uh, I don't know if I butchered that, but oh well. 
Simplicitimus. Of being simplicimus, I think is how you say it. It, it depends like on it. your pronunciation scheme. There's different Latin pronunciations. Yeah. How I would say it would be simplicissimus. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, my Latin is isn't great. Um, of I mean, you can be correct. There's like a couple correct ways of doing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As it is with not with at that level yet. Uh, given that his simplicity excludes composition of essence and existence, actuality and potency, thus God is not the sum of the divine attributes. The attributes are understood to be identical with and inseparable with the essentia die, or the essence of God. And then uh, in his entry on attributa divina, the scholastics recognize that they must immediately qualify the way in which attributes or properties are predicated of God. The attributa are not accidentia inhering in and separable from the divine substance, but are attributa essentialia, i.e. the divine attributes are the essence of God himself. Two, since God is not a composite being, the attributa are not parts of God, but in their identity with the divine essence are also identical with each other, end quote. So where Mueller is coming from here, he's looking at the scholastics, which includes the Protestant Orthodox uh, in here, he's not modifying the term scholastics, and he doesn't limit the discussion previously in the context. If you look at his note to the reader, he lays out his criteria on what he means when he says scholastics in, in his work. Um, so this would include Reformed, Lutheran, Protestant, and medieval scholastics. So you're looking at a universal confession in the scholastic tradition as it relates to simplicity and the attributes of God. Okay, so this would this would also include the high theology of Westminster, since Westminster became really the standard of Reformed theology. If you look at uh, Chad Van Dixhorn in his article, Westminster 101, he says, quote, the Westminster Confession of Faith became the dominant confession of Reformed Christianity. Terms and phrases found in the confession almost immediately became the preferred parlance of English speaking Reformed churches. And when Congregationalists, Baptists and Methodists wished to create confessional or catech uh, catechetical stand or texts of their own, they often resorted to revisiting and reissuing works produced by the Westminster Assembly. So unless we're going to say that the Westminster Assembly was unorthodox, we're left with Mueller's conclusions on the matter. So you have the stream of orthodox, the, the stream of scholasticism that confesses this single doctrine of divine simplicity. God is not composite. His attributes are not divided amongst themselves. And with the Westminster Confession of Faith falling in that stream of historical orthodoxy and becoming the standard for Reformed theology. I mean, you're you're just seeing that you have this tremendous stream. There there isn't this diversity that Jeff presents uh, among the Reformed. Um, you know that you're you're finding there, and I think it's misleading to present it that way because it doesn't deal with this at a a macro level. It's not looking at the stream of history. It's being very myopic, pulling out maybe a couple dissenters who may have been, um, you know, uh, at that time who may have identified with the Protestant or Reformed. But by and large, we're talking about this was the normal uh, way of orthodoxy as it relates to this doctrine. Uh, and it, it's just, I don't know, it's frustrating when you see um, you know, these documents and these men misrepresented in the way that they are. Yeah, I, I think the biggest proof that this is indeed the reform consensus beyond just the positive material that we've, uh, we've presented is also on the negative side where the uh, positions of Jeff do appear at that time because they weren't completely new with Jeff. They did have equivalents of um, some of his characteristics of what he calls biblical classical theism mm -hmm. in their day. Uh, but they weren't considered to be the distinctives of the Reformed. They were actually consistently treated as the distinctives of the Arminians and the Socinians by the Reformed men of the time. For example, uh, Petrus van Maastricht, he talks about uh, the identity of God's will and decree with his essence. In other words, what Jeff would describe as operational simplicity. And when he's doing so, he says that, quote, the remonstrant apologists, which if you didn't know, that's the Arminians, mm -hmm. uh, so that they may have the Socinians more favorable to them and so that they may more strongly impugn the simplicity of God and more easily obtain the mutability of the divine decrees, deny it. And you can find that in volume three of his theoretical practical theology. 
Likewise, Bavink says, uh, quote, there is the Pelagianism, Socinianism, Remonstrantism, and Rationalism, which especially opposes the immutability of God's knowing and willing and makes the will of God dependent on, and hence change in accordance with, the conduct of humans. Especially Vorstius, who is the successor of Arminius, and we'll talk about him a little bit more later, especially Vorstius and his work on God and his attributes criticized the immutability of God. He made a distinction between God's essence, which is simple and unchangeable, and God's will, which, being free, does not will everything eternally and does not always will the same thing, end quote. Now, does that sound familiar? Hmm. That's exactly what Jeff does in this book. He says, oh, God's essence is simple, but is free acts and wills and time. That, that's a different question. We got to distinguish God's essence from what he does in time. Nothing new. But Bavink, according to Bavink, that was the position of Vorstius, especially as well as g generally the Pelagians, the Socinians, and the Remonstrants and the Rationalists. So according to, to the reform men of the time, and Bavink isn't alone by this, again, uh, Pedrus and Maastricht says the same thing, so does Turidin. Those were that what that in particular was a distinctive of the Arminians and the Socinians in their doctrine of God. So, in other words, it's not among the stream of reform thought, it was rejected by the reformed as belonging to the enemy camp, basically. The same is also true when it comes to the identity of attributes as well. Yeah, and going back to Vorstius along these lines, just to give you a picture of how serious that his views were seen as <laughs> I want to read from uh, James the first. This is the, the British King, the same one who gave us the King James Bible. And actually it's interesting. This is in the same year that the King James Bible was published. I think it came out in 1611 um, that James the first was writing to the Dutch on Vorstius. And this is what uh, some of the things that he thought of him. He said, quote, but if on the contrary, contrary part, we fail of what we expect at your hands, of which God forbid, God forbid, and that you suffer hereafter such pestilent heretics to nestle among you who dare take upon them that licentious liberty to fetch again from hell the ancient heresies long since condemned, or else to invent new of their own brain, contrary to the belief of the true Catholic, Catholic, uh, Catholic Church. Sorry, I'm reading the old spelling here. Catholic Church. We shall then be constrained to our great grief publicly to protest against these abominations. And as God hath honored us with the title of defender of the faith, not only to depart and separate ourselves from the union of such false and heretical churches, but also to exhort all other reformed churches to join with us in a common council, how to extinguish and remand to hell these abominable heresies that now newly begin to put forth again, or newly begin to put forth again. So you can see the very harsh language that King James the first is using here as it relates to um, those who would follow Vorstius. And spe this is specifically talking about Vorstius, but he's laying out generic principles of how they're to deal with people like this that follow in his way. I mean, he's saying that this is doctrines from hell. And he's saying that basically that uh, they should damn to hell these abominable heresies, right? Remand yep. to hell these abominable heresies. So it was serious business. I mean, it could have political consequences. It could have life or death consequences. Um, and even and even James I is threatening to pull away from the Dutch if they he calls it nestling heretics among them, giving them safe haven, essentially. And this was not seen as a small issue. This was not seen as a small issue. It was seen as as fundamentally uh, it, you know, different from the Orthodox faith. And even someone who had problems like James did, uh, he didn't like the Puritans and he didn't like Presbyterians. Uh, there were a lot of problems there, but this was something that he was unified on, thankfully, and it seemed to you know strike a chord with him. Yeah. And, and one of the things that were, was condemned as heresy specifically, like in the midst of all this, was his doctrine of separating God's essence from his will and free acts in time. That was one of the articles that was condemned as heresy during these proceedings. And shout out, by the way, to J.E. Smith, who, who pointed. Oh, yeah. Thank you for first. forgot to mention that. 
I appreciated that. Yeah, that was very helpful. Um, I, I wouldn't have known that James the first would have even written on something like this if the brother hadn't pointed it out. So this was helpful in our preparation today. Um, again, it just provides more of that historical context that we can use to inform how serious this was, right? This yep. was not something to be trifled with. All right, uh, jumping back to the Westminster side, I want to talk about some of the characters that Jeff brings out from the assembly. So he'll say people are from the assembly that aren't, or he'll make assertions about people of the assembly that aren't true. I want to focus on a man named John Wallace that he brings up at least twice in one chapter, in chapter 14. Um, in, on page 190 of Jeff's book, uh, he says, for example, the Westminster Confession of Faith is worded in such a way that both Richard Stock, who affirmed the identity account of divine simplicity, and John Walls, Wallace, this is one of the misspellings, who denied the identity account of divine simplicity, could sign the original document without compromising their conscience. Conscience, again, another misspelling. But the point is, is made that he's asserting that uh, John Wallace, Richard Stock, signed this confession and supported the doctrine in it. But there's some things here that I find interesting. One, I couldn't find any evidence that there was actually a signatory section of the confession. I looked uh, and I did not see anything. Maybe there was, but I have a feeling that there wasn't just because of the historical context in which that confession was given. Uh, you didn't have some independent body like the particular Baptists who kind of had to put their names on it to identify who they were, as opposed to the assembly who kind of everyone knew who they were. I mean, the they were commissioned by parliament uh, to do the work. So that might be why we can't find it. But it's interesting when Jeff says that someone puts their name on a document like that, at least to me, it suggests that he was involved in formulating the theological content of that confession. Um, and what he's trying to do here, too, it also implies that one could confess the classical language, simplicity, immutability, etc., at the assembly and still disagree with the higher views of the doctrine, right? So they could all sign it and put their name on it, even though it uses specific language regarding God's essence, and they could all just kumbaya and get along, and, and you know, everyone just was able to get along under those headings, even with fundamentally different views. So Jeff is trying to present it in that way that there were people with differing views on simplicity that could all unite under one flag, right? Um, but what's interesting about this particular character, John Wallace, again, he brings him up at least twice in this chapter. He sees him as an important character in the Westminster Assembly. Wallace was not involved in any of the theological formulations of the standards themselves, but uh, was, you know, if you've seen The Office, like a glorified Pam Beasley, right? He was the secretary, he was, or a secretary, he was a note taker, right? Helping out with the administrative tasks. He was not um, involved in the theological formulations. And I find it conspicuous that that historical information is absent from the book. That's very important because it changes the discussion around his involvement and the influence that he would or would not have had on the Westminster standards. And again, I didn't have to go very far to figure this stuff out. I had just some internet sleuthing and I was able to find primary source material and secondary source material backing up what he actually did. Um, if we look at, um, this is from Puritan's Mind. Uh, it says, quote, in 1644, he acted as a secretary to the Assembly of Divines at Westminster and obtained by parliamentary decree of fellowship at Queen's College, Cambridge. Um, and he was actually requested by the assembly to be an assistant to the scribes in the assembly. This is from the House of Lords Journal, Volume 6, 1st of December, 1643, from British History Online. So this is essentially from the minutes of a session um, where the assembly requested of Parliament for him to be there. They say, quote, lastly, the assembly having diverse weighty business imposed on them by one or both of the honorable houses of Parliament, which do occasion extraordinary labor to the scribes and lay upon them more work than they are able to dispatch, the assembly prayeth that the honorable houses of parliament would please to add Mr. John Wallace, a godly and judicious young man, to be in a mate, a manusis, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, an assistant to the scribes, both in the assembly and elsewhere in this public service. So he wasn't, he wasn't involved in any of the theological formulations. Even their specific request was not for someone to help them put the documents together in a theological sense. 
but so that he could help with the administrative burden on the other scribes that were there at the assembly. And that, that has huge implications for what Jeff is trying to say in uh, his book. Um, so he wasn't even on the, the short list to do the work of the assembly. Uh, there's another, uh, James Reed wrote um, some biographical information on him, and he was not, he says that he was not in the assembly from the commencement of the session, nor is his name in the ordinance for calling that assembly. He wasn't even on the short list to be part of the original assembly. He came later. Um, so, you know, the work had already begun at that point. So trying to use him as a dissenter on simplicity among the assembly is misleading at best and devious at worst. If he did this on purpose, like leaving out certain information to trick people, that would be the worst. But at the very least, it's misleading, right? Because you're leaving out key information that has to do with, you know, the, the implications of what this means. But his critical role or the critical component of his role in the assembly makes his descent from the rest of the divine's understanding on this issue moot. It doesn't matter because he wasn't involved in the theological formulations of the documents. So even if he did dissent from them, maybe in his personal writings, who cares? That's not what the Westminsterians believed. We proved that earlier, reading from Chanel and Jeremiah Burroughs and Mueller. So when you say things like that, it's helpful to provide that clarification of what they actually did rather than just trying to present the assembly as just some massive disjointed uh you know mess of of different views of simplicity that they all just kind of piled their names on and tried to be under one banner on in terms of the same theological uh terminology so i i think there's it's it's Problematic to do that, obviously, and I think just from a scholarly perspective, as somebody who is ahead of a seminary and is putting himself in that category of scholarly uh, standards that he should not be making either mistakes like that or leaving out key information deliberately, um, that's the work of a scholar. They're supposed to provide the information that's relevant to their discussion and not leave out key information. Yep, All right. Yeah, go ahead. Andy. It's, it's, no, I don't have too much to add, except it's it's pretty embarrassing, honestly. Yeah. And, and that's just the way it's point. presented. It really versus, is embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. It's, he's just a secretary. He didn't help formulate the doctrine. No. He's not this key theological. It really doctor. is embarrassing. And we all yeah. make mistakes on, on historical data. It happens. Sure. But this did not, this was not hard for me to find. Like, I didn't have to go very far. Yeah, I had to do a little digging, but it was, I didn't have to go to some, you know, musty library in London or in England to go and pull up some old minutes somewhere hidden in the basement. It, this was readily available. I just had to, I just had to do a little bit of legwork and I, and I don't claim to be the head of a seminary. So it really is embarrassing uh, that this kind of historic sloppy historical work was done in this work. Yeah. We, we all have full-time secular jobs. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're doing this in our free time and we're yeah. able to find this information. Don't get paid for it. <laughs> yeah. Really, and he wrote a book on on these things. And and yeah, he should be. I got twenty dollars. of. I think I got twenty dollars in royalties from her book. That's the only payment I've ever. Right. <laughs> <laughs> twenty bucks. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yeah. It's frustrating. Um, and then another frustrating thing from historical perspective, he uses the term Westminster divine um, for really. For a bunch of different people, right, in, in the book. So there's two men in chapter 14 that he claims are Westminster divines, Richard Stock, John Howe. These men were not divines, okay? So there you can easily look up online a list of the Westminster divines. I mean, it's readily available. You can, I mean, you in multiple places, you can find the list of who was at the assembly, who was considered there, right? And Wallace does show up there, right? He is a member of the assembly, but these two men do not. On page 173, Jeff seems to distinguish how as a Puritan as opposed to John Wallace, who is a divine. But on page 180, he unequivocally claims that how is a divine. It says, quote, along with the Westminster divines, John Wallace and John Howe dismissed it. So he seems to contradict himself. And then he just, yeah, John Howe is a Westminster divine. OK, that's that's false. And then Richard Stock. Now, this one got me. I, you know, I was looking at Richard Stock. Um, again, he's not on the list, but it seems that Richard Stock 
had died 20 years before the Westminster Confession was created. If it's the, the same one I was looking up in it, I think it was. Um, but it would have been impossible for him to have been at the assembly. So he's not even on the list of divines, but he probably, if it's the same one, he was dead before, long before the assembly even was convened. So like earlier with the list of theologians that Andrew brought forth, you know, with uh, Tertullian and Hodge and Calvin, you're seeing the list whittle down pretty uh, quite a bit. You only have one person, at least in this chapter, that is listed as a Westminster divine, and that person was not even involved in the theological formulations of the document, regardless of what his view was. So you really have nothing effectively. Yeah. Um, so it, <laughs> you have worse it than just, nothing. Just kind of like sit there with your mouth gaping open, like, wow, yeah. what in the world did he do with this historical data? Yeah, and you have worse than nothing when many of these men actively condemned his right. doctrine as being a distinctive of the non-reformed camps. Right. So when you have those things together, like that, it's not a separate stream within reformed orthodoxy. It never has been, and it never should be. Right. Unless you consider some of the 20th century stuff as part of that stream, which yeah, if they hold to that, I don't. So yeah, and I'm willing to grant. Um, and I think so. Jeff says that John Wallace was, uh, you know, didn't believe in the identity account, and I think that might be true. I didn't. I don't remember if I found anything on that, and I'm willing to grant him that. Um, but he was a. I think he was a mathematician, from what I saw. He yeah, he, that's right. Technology that's right. wasn't his forte. You know, it wasn't his his focal point. Um, and so I think it'd be easy to see why he might mess up in something like that. Um, but again, he just wasn't part of that core group of people that had anything to do with formulating the theology. Yeah, that wasn't even his vocation. No, it's not a theologian by vocation. No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> um, OK, so looking at the the so we looked at Westminster, right? Now we're looking at the particular Baptist tradition. Now, this is going to be interesting because this is the tradition that Jeff identifies himself with. And I think this will And what's interesting, too, there's from what I remember, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Andrew, but I don't remember seeing anything about particular Baptists in his book. Zero. No. From what I remember, I don't I don't remember seeing anything in relation to the particular Baptist tradition. Um. But it is interesting that he does at least not focus on that or, or you know, give credence to it. I think that would have been very helpful. If you say you identify with the tradition, this specific tradition, why would you not want to demonstrate that that tradition is, in fact, in line with your theological views if you're making a point from that time in history uh, that there was this diversity of views. Why not say, okay, yeah, we have the Westminster guys, but what about my tradition? The, the Baptists, you know, yeah, they went down the road I did. Here's where they did that. You know, you would think that would be uh, something important to talk about. And like we talked about last time, there is this absence of, at least from what I recall, any kind of philosophical discussions from the 17th century as it relates to the Trinity. So you have that important aspect doesn't appear to be there. And then you don't, there doesn't appear to be anything of particular Baptist history in relation to his tradition or against it, right? His understanding of these things um, or against it. So why not discuss that tradition? It, you'd think it would be helpful, but I don't think there's anything there. So looking at um, what we do see with the particular Baptists, we do see them coming very close to the language of the 1646 Westminster Confession in many ways, which shows the identification of the PBs with their other particular Baptists with their reformed fathers. And that's pretty common language. They, you know, they use the Westminster, they use the Savoy, and I think some of the first London Baptist confession of faith. So they're, they're not reinventing the wheel here. Okay. That's, I think that's pretty common knowledge at this point. And if, especially on the doctrine of God, um, for the 1644 London Baptist confession of faith, which is the very first one, first edition, uh, we see them adopting this traditional theology proper. And Renahan's book here uh, for the Vindication of the Truth, if you don't have it, get it. Very helpful for Baptist history and understanding theology in the uh, First London Baptist Confession of Faith. But Renahan says this, the Baptist Confession employs common language incorporated into all the major post-Reformation creeds. So, And this is from page 36. 
So Renahan is saying that the language that they are using is going to continue to be used later, or at least, you know, the, the, the similar meaning or similar language that carries the same meanings. So they're falling in the stream and the post-Reformation is going to continue in it. Okay. And we also see Renahan talks about William Ames, who we quoted earlier as being used in the formulation of this confession. You see pages 29 and 30 of, of his commentary where he talks about that. Um, and there is, again, this continuity of doctrine playing out before the Westminster standards were even created. So they're falling with Ames, who's falling before him, who's falling before him. And then the Westminster Assembly is just reiterating that at a macro level, at the political, the highest levels of government. Um, so it's much more, uh, much more common, I guess, from that perspective. But I want to read something here from Renahan's book. This is the bottom of page 34. Um, he says, notice that portions of the second article of the first LCF 44 are reworked into the latter part of the first article of first LC, LCF 46. The language, greatness, wisdom, power, justice, goodness, truth is very similar to the Westminster Shorter Catechism in its question, what is God? And answer, God is spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. This statement precedes the publication of the Shorter Catechism, but it expresses the same doctrine. What does this tell us? Not that the Westminster divines borrowed these words, but rather this is the common currency of speech defining God in the mid 1640s. Mm -hmm. By all accounts, these Baptists are drawing upon broadly expressed idiom, at least in an English context, to help us understand who God is. This is a good thing. It ought to be refreshing to us. They were confessing their faith in language known and easily understood. So the particular Baptists weren't coming up with anything new. Again, I keep saying that, but I think uh, that has to be stated again and again and again. So as we mentioned this earlier, what Jeff is presenting in his book is the appearance that there was significant disagreement among the Reformed as it relates to simplicity, yet given these confessions and what we talked about earlier about Westminster, you don't see that. You don't see that. Okay. Uh, there's, so there's much more unity uh, than Jeff presents. Much more unity than Jeff presents. And then you jump forward about 30, 40 years for the second London Baptist Confession of Faith. And you see that coming onto the scene. And this confession was, you know, falling in line with Westminster theology and, and what came before it. Okay. And on the doctrine of God, there is very little difference in the language used and no difference in the fundamental theology. You can look at chapter two of both those confessions and they read basically identical. Um, and it's also important to point out that the issue of God was not seen as a secondary matter to have polite disagreements on by the particular Baptists. And we, I touched upon this a little bit last week at the end of the episode, um, but I want to dive into this a little bit more. Going back to Thomas Collier, who was that heretic that particular Baptist heretic who deviated from orthodoxy. And what's interesting about him is that he was pretty well established among particular Baptists. He was well known. He wasn't some guy in some random church somewhere that just started teaching false doctrine. He was well known among particular Baptists. And so it became a huge problem when he comes on the scene and starts teaching these heretical doctrines. And so they had to deal with him, right? So there was quite a bit of writing back and forth and, and trying to resolve the issue. And at the end of the day, um, they had to essentially condemn him as a heretic and, and put him out. Um, but you see, like, again, Nehemiah Cox writing about this uh, a, vindic a vindication of the truth in one of the defenses against Collier. Um, and really in the title, the heresies and gross errors asserted by Thomas Collier in his additional word to his body of divinity. And two verses that Cox cites on the title page, 1 Corinthians 11, 19 and 2 Peter 3, 17, both of those pointing, point to avoiding those who subvert the faith at a fundamental level. So he's already seeing this as these are critical issues. This is not something secondary we can deal with. And actually, the very first chapter that Cox uses is on uh, theology proper before he gets to salvation, before he gets to man standing before God, man's sinfulness. Theology proper is number one. Okay. Now, Renahan and his uh, com because Renahan edited this work, um, he says that Cox lays out in his work that, quote, that doctrine which the Church of God hath always been possessed of. It's from page 11. So 
what Cox is saying, he's not identifying, he's not saying I'm a Thomist or I'm an Augustinian or anything like that. He's saying this is just the truth that the church has always had. This is the faith that has been passed down. We've possessed this. I'm just reiterating what everyone should know already, right? I'm not creating anything new. I'm just having to defend against this dissenter. Um, so he was, he just was seeing what was found in scripture and Orthodox tradition. And I quoted this last week. There can be no gospel peace without truth, nor communion of saints without an agreement in the fundamental principles of the Christian religion. So this is fundamental to the faith from Cox's mind. It was seen as critical. And then when Collier refused to repent, he was written off as a heretic. And, you know, one of the reasons cited is because he rejected the God of Scripture, that he hath chosen opinions that do subvert some fundamental articles of Christian religion and are inconsistent with holding the head. And uh, that's quoted in Sam Renahan's book, The Petty France Church, Part 1, page 101. So it was it was seen as subverting fundamental doctrine. And they saw obstinance and persistence in this false doctrine was to put oneself outside of the faith. So they were willing to grant, and they actually talk about this, that Christians can fall into false doctrine. They can say things that are in error, and that's not the issue. It should be corrected, but that's not the, the issue that they're dealing with here. This is someone who continued and persisted in it. and you know, after he was corrected and doubled down, essentially, uh, he was considered someone that should be avoided. Right. And this is interesting, too, because it follows in a similar fashion with how the Westminster uh, Assembly saw this and how to deal with people. Now, the Westminster Assembly is dealing with this from a magisterial level. So you're talking about putting people to death, using the sword against heretics. Um, which obviously we wouldn't advocate, but some of the same principles are there as it relates to, um, you know, being patient with people, not writing them off just because they have a slip of the tongue, but people who are persistent in error. And I'll read some of what uh, Francis Chanel, Westminster Divine, said here. He said, The magistrate draw the sword in God's name. It is not to punish simple error but to smite some intolerable error that is twisted and complicated with blasphemy, apostasy, obstinacy, or some such sins as are eminent in seducing heretics and destructive to the souls, religion, and peace of Christians. Some er erroneous persons have the itch and some the plague. Some of them are melancholy and some of them are mad. So he he's kind of fall the Baptists are falling in that same stream or vein of thought in as much as we're patient and then we move to you know greater sanctions as the situation worsens so you do see this kind of uh difference here and similarity but one thing that's i think really sobering and andrew and i i brought this up to andrew earlier this week is that in all likelihood jeff teaching the views that he did he does in that historical context he may have been put to death by the crown in all likelihood. You know, we're not advocating for that. I'm just I'm just giving the historical reality of his doctrine put into that context. It could have ended up there. And yeah. again, that that's to show how serious this doctrine was in moving see how serious deviating from orthodoxy was on this issue. So it's not seen as you just write a book, people, you know, throw a fit about it or whatever, and we move on and we're just all brothers and we act like everything's okay. There was, that's not how it was back then. Even among the Baptists, they dealt with it, they tried to deal with it swiftly and harshly where needed. And with those who were in the magistrate who saw the sword as enforcing religion and squashing heretics, it could have ended up with your head on a platter. That, that's just the historical reality. That's not to be flippant. That's just the historical reality. And I think it highlights the seriousness of what we're talking about here. Yeah, we can criticize the wrong use of the sword in religious yes. affairs while also seeing in that that these things are not considered to be adiaphora and that, yeah. our, that the level of tolerance we have for these kinds of deviations today is so far out of bounds with historic Christianity.
we're the weird ones, historically speaking, right? We, we don't want to bring back the sword and matters of religion exactly. in that, that kind of way. Yep. Um, we will talk a little bit more about the interface of those two in our next episode when we talk about Christian nationalism. Mm -hmm. But um, but so we don't want to do that, but we can acknowledge that, well, while the state might not be supposed to do that, the church would still at least take these yeah, things seriously. A, for, for, at a minimum. <laughs> yeah, the church should at least continue to, to understand how important these things are. That's not just the reform. That's all the way back. That's all the way back. People held these doctrines in very high esteem. And we have a, our, our standard of tolerance is out of bounds with oh, yeah. Christianity. It's not even close. So I actually laugh sometimes when I hear people say, oh, we live in such a polarizing time. Maybe on some issues that might be true. But in general, we're like one of the most unpolarized times ever when it comes to the, the cardinal doctrines of the faith. One oh, of yeah. the most we're, ecumenical we're just... periods in church history. Like, easy, oh, yeah. If yeah, you read we're, the we're just going to sweep those things quickly. under the rug. <laughs> yeah. Yep. 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 And we're, we're just willing to, to tolerate so much, you know, when it's beyond just simple error, you know, it beyond just simple error. It's it's very frustrating. Um, so looking just a, very, very briefly at some of the, the signers of the Second London Baptist Confession, Benjamin Keach is one of the well, more well-known ones. Um, he discusses simplicity specifically where the attributes are equal to one another and as the divine essence itself. And you can see where we talked about Mueller with the identity of the attributes. But he says, quote, all God's attributes are equal. His mercy is not beyond his justice, nor is justice, nor justice beyond mercy. And that his essence is himself and so are his attributes also. That's from Keech's Beams of Light. Now, what's interesting is this sounds a lot like Gregory went from yep. the quote that brought earlier. There's no greater than or less than within God, right? It's very similar. And he's identifying the attributes of God with the divine essence. And Keech obviously confessed simplicity because he signed the Confession of Faith. And that was considered a crucial doctrine. So you you do see this clear understanding of, of God's attributes being identified with uh, the divine essence. Um, if you're looking at William Kiffin, he was another signer. He was a, actually a signer of the First London Baptist Confession of Faith and the Second, and he had his name on every version of the First London Baptist Confession of Faith, and then, of course, on the Second. So he was quite older when the Second came along. But again, it just shows this continuity of theology from the First to the Second. And he was confessing these classical understandings of those principles um, that we've discussed already. Similar with Hanser Nolly, signed the 1646 First London Baptist Confession of Faith and the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. Again, continuity there. And then Nehemiah Cox, who we mentioned already, possibly the writer or one of the writers of the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, and using very similar language regarding um, the doctrine of God to that of Aquinas, Ames, and the church in general. Yeah, and I'll add just one more particular Baptist testimony to reinforce how seriously that they took these issues. John Gill, from part three of The Cause of God and Truth, when he's responding to his uh, anti-Calvinistic opponent, Gill says that any implication that God's love or mercy, for example, are like the affections or passions that are, quote, moved, raised, and influenced by anything out of himself, end quote, is to conceive most unworthily of unworthily of him, excuse me, to take him to be altogether such a one as ourselves and savors rankly of atheism and scarcely deserves any other name, end quote. So you can find that on page 56 if you have particular Baptist, uh, heritage, excuse me, particular Baptist Heritage Press's edition of it. That's on page 56 of volume two of the works of John Gill. But this seems to be exactly how Jeff describes God in his book. He separates God's acts of love and mercy from his essence and describes God as really in himself feeling different at different times in response to the actions of his creatures. As if he was moving along our timeline with us and experiencing something different at each point in time according to the circumstances. Which, of course, implies that there's something these moments of time are providing to him uh, that he's lacked in his eternal comprehension of all moments of time in himself. So we delved into that topic a lot in our first episode. I'm not going to rehash all that here. But the point is simply that it's hard to come away with any other conclusion that 
than that John Gill would describe Jeff's doctrine of God, doctrine of God, as scarcely better than atheism. That's how John Gill describes such views. So if you're going to get angry, get angry with him. Don't get angry with me. That's what John Gill says. Yeah. Uh, these <laughs> subjects were hardly considered to be adiaphora by our uh, particular Baptist forebears. So how far have we departed from their standards if we're willing to promote and partner with people who teach such things today? Yeah, it atheism, man. I mean, we we can our, our concept of atheism is so different than it was back then. I mean, we're we're just well, I don't believe in God. I, I just deny there's a God. So you're considered an atheist or maybe an agnostic at best. But no, just just you claim to be a Christian and you got God wrong. You could be written off as an atheist. So you don't believe in any God at all because that's not a real God. Yeah, right. It's, it's, not like God Bible. it's not a God that exists. So how can you believe in any God? Yeah, yeah, that's more like Zeus than the real God of the Bible. Yeah, it's more like Zeus than the real God. Where he's of the Bible. reacting, responding. He gets angry. He 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 does all these things in yep. parallel with creatures. He he responds to them. They add to him somehow. They affect him in some way. Mm -hmm. Like that's much more like the gods of Greek paganism than the God of the Bible. Who while who while he he truly loves us, he fellowships with us, he hates sin. He does this not by way of reaction in time by moving along the timeline with us, but through his eternal hostility to sin his eternal his eternal mm -hmm. delight in the saints um all of which is directed to himself by that one simple act that he is so it's not like the gods of pagan philosophy and that's what makes him so majestic is that he's able to do all these great and wonderful things yes. without being like finite corruptible creatures amen amen all right so shifting gears a little bit here so craig carter um, I'll go through this very quickly, but he interacts with Craig Carter, I think in one or two places. Um, I know at least in the place that I'm going to be discussing here, he talks about Christian Platonism. And this is interesting because, um, I, you know, we've had, um, Craig Carter on the show before a while back. And I, I think we talked about the topic of uh, Christian Platonism. And I think that that term kind of ruffled some people's feathers back in the day, even when it came out, but, I think Carter is is pretty good about defining what he means by that. And Jeff seems to uh, think that there's no room for any kind of any version whatsoever of Platonism within Christian language or theology. Now, uh, the book that he references is different than the one I have here. Uh, the one that Jeff references of Carter, I'm using uh, interpreting scripture with the great tradition, which has an extensive discussion of Christian Platonism. So it's, it more than suffices to deal with the, the issue, um, that Jeff is presenting, but Carter really is looking at this from, you know, Augustine's perspective around Platonism, Christianity. And I, he looks at, at the very least at Augustine's city of God. And that's really where he's kind of pulling from. Um, and he's pointing out that Augustine was not buying Platonism in its entirety. Augustine was trying to see where those things that were consistent with Christian dogma and doctrine that could be utilized in rejecting those that were not. But Augustine was really seeing Platonism kind of, you know, in his unbelieving days as there were things that overlapped with Christianity in as much as, you know, they were seeing things from the light of nature. Right. Yeah. And that's wanna... very basic Christianity, too. I mean, this is Romans one. I mean, very basic stuff that Augustine was using here. Yeah. And I want to emphasize real quick for Augustine, the, the dependency is the other way around, just to be very clear. Like Augustine's not like, Oh, look at all the bright things that the Platonists came up with. Let me sneak that in Christian theology. When Augustine discusses the topic of Platonism, he held to the traditional view that uh, Plato and other Greek philosophers got some things right because yep. certain copies of the Hebrew scriptures had been translated and were um, circulating around the places where they taught. So if there's a dependency, he thought it was the other way around. So that's an aspect I don't think is really talked about a lot today. People assume when you're talking about Christian Platonism, we're talking about, oh, we, we Christianity needs to borrow from them. Augustine was rather recognizing where, where Platonism borrowed from the truths of Christianity. Right. Um, yep. And, and saying, well, we can have agreement in, in those areas. Uh, so either uh, we could say either directly from them having the scriptures in their day or else from the light of nature, uh, being able to understand the things that you can understand from the light of nature. Ultimately, God is the author of truth, not 
uh, these men. And so I understand why, sorry not to derail you too much. Dan, no, no. I want to say real quick that I understand why some people have an issue with the term Christian Platonism because I can see how it might imply the reverse for some people like, oh, we're, we're mm -hmm. part of a broader movement and Christianity is just kind of a subcategory of this movement we're drawing from in some way. Um, so I, I can understand why people have issues with the term, but in terms of the doctrine of what's being taught, anybody who opposes Carter's articulation of Christian Platonism, I have to ask you, which of the five points that he lays out do you disagree with? I've never heard anybody who criticizes him address which of the five points that he says defines Christian Platonism that they disagree with. Because what it boils down to is basically you believe in the immaterial and you're not a nominalist. You believe that categories are real. He has a very basic, broad definition of what he means by Platonism that any Christian, by just being a supernaturalist, would have to agree with to, to some extent. So this is an example, I think, of people just reacting so hostily to the term that they're ignoring what Carter is actually taught on that subject. Yeah. And some some areas of agreement that like that Augustine brought out, you have like, uh, or at least that the, the Platonists would agree with in a, in a Christian context, God is the cause of existence. God must be immutable and not part of anything material. God is the uncaused cause of everything that isn't God. I mean, yeah. it, who disagrees with that? Who disagrees with that as a Christian? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Jeff, and so if you're attacking it, I mean, hello. <laughs> yeah, so if you're attacking it, I have to ask, do you disagree with that? Or is right. that what you're trying to tell us? Like, what? Of yeah. Not. And really, Christian Platonism, yeah. and Carter kind of brings us up, he says, quote, saw no reason to give up their previous philosophical beliefs where those beliefs were not contradicted by Christian dogma because they were using Christian dogma to formulate their understanding of philosophy. Like like you said, it it's the way around with regards to revelation influencing what they're thinking not using their philosophy to influence their thinking of revelation so they were formulating their philosophy on the basis of of christian dogma right i mean that isn't that what we're supposed isn't that solo scriptura isn't that what we're supposed to be doing mm -hmm. and this again this seems very basic um but jeff says on page 135 of his book unequivocally platonism in any form is not built on natural revelation neither does it correspond with special revelation and this includes Christian Platonism, which he explicitly says earlier on in the paragraph. So he's ruling out any category of Platonism that could be any of that language, any of those concepts cannot be adopted. But he's assuming concepts taught by Platonism all the time, at least in word. Um, and so it, it's just very strange that it, it just suggests to me that he probably doesn't understand, you know, the categories he's dealing with at all or interacted with Carter on any meaningful level, because Carter lays these things out very clearly. I mean, <laughs> he goes through history and, and Augustine as it relates to these things. I, I don't understand uh, why this is so hard, but here we are. Oh, and he tries to present Christian Platonism as some sort of offshoot of uh, Christianity, uh, which, of course, is ridiculous because the principles in Christian Platonism, well, you don't have that term. That's an anachronistic term. It's just a descriptive term. But the principles there are found throughout Christian history, right? Taking yeah. the good and throwing out the bad based on the revelation that God has given us. That is Christianity 101. That's our epistemology. That's a fundamental uh, aspect of the Reformation. This isn't difficult. <laughs> yeah. yeah, There's certainly some bad forms of what you could call Christian Platonism out there. Like when you talk about Clement of Alexandria or Origen, for example, be like Origen speculated that. I think men in their original and final state will be like spheres and things like that. Very, very, like they're drawn from the bad part of Platonism. But when you're talking about the broad sense, as Carter defines it, yep. don't criticize somebody for just for the name while you ignore the doctrine that they're putting forward. Exactly. Yeah. Anyways, um, so unless you have something else to say about that, Dan, nope, I guess I'll move on to uh, the last person I wanted to talk about, who I've mentioned someone already. Uh, we've discussed men of the early church and reformation, so I thought it was fitting to close with a 19th slash 20th century theologian uh, before we wrap this up, namely Bovink. Jeff cites Herman Bovink a number of times throughout his book in support of his position, one of which we already covered when we were talking about Gregory of Nyssa, uh, as quoting him out of context. 
But uh, it should be said that when we get to the time of Bavink, uh, we're indeed coming to an era with significant theological transition. Uh, and Bavink did play some part of that, so I won't deny that altogether, especially when it comes to the doctrine of Scripture, as well as things such as the collapse of the two kingdoms and the weakening of the nature-grace distinction. And even in the doctrine of God, we see Bavink use some language that wasn't used in earlier ages that I think ended up bringing in more harm than good, such as the language of consciousness as applied to God and the members of the Trinity. Now, what Bavink meant by it was orthodox. I'm not accusing him of any wrong in what he believed on those things, but I think the terms themselves, they're, they're so loaded with reflexive and other connotations that they ended up doing more harm than good. But nevertheless... On the whole, Bavink is actually an excellent source on the doctrine of God. And he by no means teaches anything close to what Jeff teaches in his book. Mm -mm. For example, on the subject of the knowledge of God, Bavink affirms precisely the type of incomprehensibility that Jeff denies. Last episode, we talked about how Jeff views analogical language of God as being like comparing apples and oranges. So you got some things different, you got some things the same. This is also known, again, as the analogy of similitude that we discussed in that episode, which is improper when we're talking about God. Uh, but Bavink's view is quite different. Here's what he says. Quote, Scripture and the church emphatically assert the unsearchable majesty and sovereign highness of God. There is no knowledge of God as he is in himself. We are human, and he is the Lord our God. There is no name that fully expresses his being, no definition that captures him. He infinitely transcends our picture of him, our ideas of him, our language concerning him. He is not comparable to any creature. All the nations are accounted by him as less than nothing and vanity. And that's from Reformed Dogmatics, Volume 2. Uh, page 47 to 48 on Lagos edition. And later on in the same section, he says, quote, the knowledge we have of God is altogether unique. This knowledge may be called positive insofar as by it we recognize a being infinite and distinct from all finite creatures. On the other hand, it is negative because we cannot ascribe a single predicate to God as we conceive that predicate in relation to creatures. It is therefore an analogical knowledge a knowledge of a being who is unknown in himself, yet able to make something of himself known in the being he created, end quote. So as clear as can be, Bavink affirms that when we speak of analogy in relation to God, we're not saying that there are some things we have in common and other things that we don't on an ontological level. He says there is not a single predicate, not a single thing, that we can ascribe to God in the same way that we ascribe it to creatures. It's analogical language in its entirety. In other words, absolutely nothing that we say about God captures him as he is in himself, but rather expresses that truth in an analogical way. Again, we delved into that more in our last episode. I encourage you to take a listen to that. And Balvang is equally clear and even more so if you read the section in context, that the view he's presenting is simply the view of the church. From Augustine to Aquinas to the Reformers, they all agreed on this. And that's because it's the teaching of Scripture, the teaching of biblical Christianity. Likewise, Bavin affirms that all of God's acts in time are the free application of his one single immutable will, rather than separate acts of the will like Jeff's view puts forward. He says, quote, neither creation nor revelation nor incarnation effects, etc., brought about any change in God. No new plan ever arose in God. In God, there was always one single immutable will. In God, the former purpose is not altered and obliterated by the subsequent and different purpose, but by one and the same eternal and unchangeable will he effected regarding the things he created, both that formerly, so long as they were not, they should not be, and that subsequently, when they began to be, they should come into existence. That's page 154. All of God's acts, according to Bavink, came about by his eternal will, and there are no new or different wills that God has in time, as if there was something lacking in his eternal will that needed a supplement, that needed additional willings to compensate for it, when he wills temporal things. 
nor is this eternal will in any way distinct from his essence. On the contrary, he says later on, quote, the counsel of God is the eternally active will of God, the willing and deciding God himself, not something accidental in God, but one with his being as his eternally active will, end quote. Bob Inc., therefore, quite explicitly affirms what Jeff calls operational simplicity, a core tenet of, again, what he calls philosophical classical theism. God is his will, according to Bavink. He is the willing and deciding God himself. That's what his will is. It's one with his being. And his divine counsel is simply that very same eternally active will of God, which orders all things by that one simple, pure act that he is. And I'll add just one more quote. The counsel of God, accordingly, must be considered a single and simple decree. At the Westminster Assembly, the delegates discuss whether to speak of the decree in the singular or in the plural. The Westminster Confession only uses the word in the singular. And indeed, the world plan is one simple conception in the mind of God. Just as Minerva emerges full-grown from the head of Jupiter, and just as a genius all at once completely grasps the idea of a work of art, so the world plan is eternally complete in the divine consciousness, end quote. Bavink is not on Jeff's side. If that doesn't make it clear, I don't know what possibly could. And he serves as just another witness that his view was simply the view of the Reformed who wrote our confessions of faith. They decided on decree, not decrees. These were not in-house debates among them. Bavink, as well as Turden and Petrus from Maastricht, to name a few, put this forth as the Reformed view in contradistinction to the views of the Socinians and the Arminians. To affirm what Jeff calls philosophical classical theism is simply to affirm true biblical classical theism, whereas his own so-called biblical classical theism is falsely so-called and has more in common with the theism of the historic enemies of the Reformed and biblical faith. And that's just a historical fact. Yep. So you're seeing even the old reform guys and modern reform guys like Bavink all confessing the same theology, right? And and pushing back against this. This is this is dangerous, dangerous, danger, danger. Not biblical. Not biblical. Not biblical. And you see this continuous stream throughout church history confessing. Uh, these doctrines, and I want to I want to say this um, as we close, and then I see some comments here that I want to to get to from the audience. Jeff has a massive mountain to climb to prove his theological position. I think we demonstrated that last week, but not only does he have to substantiate it biblically, but he would have to do it historically if he's going to make historical uh, assertions, and if he's going to identify with a particular tradition. Uh, that utilizes this kind of language and uh, theological concepts on such a fundamental issue. He claims to be a Reformed Baptist, which means he claims to identify with that Reformed tradition, right? But he deviates from it fundamentally, and I think we've demonstrated that. You know, If he wishes to continue in those theological views, he would need to be honest and say he does not agree with the historical position of his tradition and call himself something else. Or that would be the honest thing to do, to say, yeah, I, I just can't go down the road with those guys theologically, So I, and this is fundamental, so I need, to, I need to change what I call myself here. Otherwise, you're causing confusion, and you're not being honest as it relates to um, the historical position, okay, and in your identification with it using the same historical terminology while at the same time denying their meaning causes confusion and doesn't truly represent who you are and frankly it's embarrassing that we have people among reformed baptists that try to hold on to the confessional heritage who really have no business being among us given their denial of fundamental doctrines held by that tradition and i don't think there's an excuse for it i think we have a high calling as christians to be people who speak truth, Ephesians 4.25. And I have a hard time seeing how saying you believe one thing over here while completely undermining yourself on the other hand is not a violation of that 
passage. We're to be pursuing truth. We're to be going after truth. We're to be speaking truth. It's a command. It's an imperative. And that applies to everything. No less for our history in terms of what we say we believe about a particular tradition that we identify with. Speaking truth is something we should all strive for. And I think even more so for those who are in the high office of pastor and the position of high scholarship, there, I, there's, at least for the pastoral side, there's higher standards that are there uh, in reputational standards that you have to uphold, that you are called to be. And you need to speak truth. That's part of that. You need to, to be truthful in terms of theology that you're bringing and the tradition that you claim to identify with. Um, so the standards are higher, and I, I think we should act like it as Christians. Okay. It's it's biblical. You know that that might sound harsh, but I'm I'm quoting scripture here, Ephesians four twenty five, that we're to speak the truth, right? We're to put away all lying, and we're to speak truth. That's not a a suggestion; it's a command. That's for all of us. We're all to strive for that. Uh, and I don't see how someone can say that they hold to a particular tradition that they fundamentally disagree with and then continue to go down that road and, and hold that title over their head while continuing to fundamentally differ with that tradition. It, it doesn't work. No. It doesn't That's work. the most important area of truth of all too. the truth about yes. God is who yep. Christ is. It doesn't get more important and <laughs> fundamental than those things that that's our life that's our foundation that's our ground and we want our terms and what we call ourselves to make those things clear right rather than confuse them so amen to that yep all right i want to get to some of these comments real quick um thanks for bearing with us everyone i know it's another long episode um paul hess paul brother good to see you um what would you consider to be the fundamental error of johnson's book poor non-existent exe uh, exegesis, poor dishonest historiography, something else. And then he says, what is his fatal flaw? I think he's using Jeff's language there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's got to just be his, obviously, doctrine of God. That's, I guess maybe that's too broad of a, of a term. I mean, historiography, it's really important, but that has to be secondary to the doctrine as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, even though they can tie together, like, if you don't see a view among the good guys in history, that should be a big red flag uh, for you. But it, it's not sticking with the the simple faith that, you know, God depends on nothing else, right? He's, he's not uh, composite in any ways, right? And he can do all things by that eternal simple essence that he is. And if he's stuck with that, then I think everything else would come in line at that point. Yeah, I think it's hard with a book like this to say, like, there's one thing that the whole thing just crumbles on. I, it's just it's a lot of different things that he's trying to stilt up his position with that you kind of have to, you know, to, to crumble. I don't think there's any one thing that you can point to and then the whole thing crumbles. Um, but yeah, I mean, at, at a macro level, it really just is his doctrine of God is not aligned with what scripture teaches and its historical reality. So yeah. What can you, you could try to pull the thread a bit more of like, okay, well, yeah. how did you get to his doctrine? Is there hermeneutical issues that came in there? Um, not reading the Bible with the analogy of faith in the back of your mind, you know, really mm -hmm. reading all of it as the word of God supposed to be taken together as the standard for the church and instead dividing it up into these micro audiences with micro purposes and not considering how it all figures. I think that's a big problem in broader evangelicalism uh, in general. I don't know if that's how he got where he is, but oftentimes there is a close relation between that kind of, I don't know, biblicist, hermeneutic, and uh, this kind of doctrine as well. So you could kind of pull on that thread because I mean, you pointed out exegesis, but I, I can't say definitively uh, where it began for him. Yep. Um, and then Hudson is back. Hudson, thanks for joining us. I know you were with us last week. Uh, Herman Bobbing sounds like a Muslim. God is unlike creation. <laughs> <laughs> that's what a Muslim sounds like to you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know. That's how actually all, I mean, just look at the list of men that he cites. Like that's all Christian theologians basically up, up till that time. And 
again in our day. So if that sounds like a Muslim and doesn't sound like a Christian, I mean, I guess you just haven't read any <laughs> Christian works past the last 50 years. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Um, I mean, why did God create a pure bliss simplicity? So we, we talked about this last week um, as it relates to God's free action, despite the fact that he doesn't change or take on any other states of being. Um, so I would point you back to last week. I mean, I, I'm not going to rehash everything here that we talked about last week, but if you listen to the first episode, we do address that specifically. Yeah. Um, and um, then, yeah, go ahead. If, if I could just say quickly, the short answer is out of his own good pleasure. And yeah. that's the result of, of everything that we're talking about, that that can be yep. true, right? God says in the scriptures that he does it all uh, out of the good pleasure of his counsel and will. You can see that in Ephesians chapter one, for example. Um, and if it were, if the doctrine of God were otherwise than what it is, that'd be hard to uh, maintain. If you don't assert that God is all sufficient and all content within himself, then there's something that he's lacking or something of necessity that's driving him to create, like he's lonely or something like that. Then it's not out of his good pleasure. It's because he's trying to satisfy some need. And that's an mm -hmm. unworthy view to have of, of God. So that makes it all the more majestic and wonderful that he has created, that it was out of his good pleasure, and that he actually didn't have to create. He could have remained in that pure bliss of simplicity, mm -hmm. but but he, ch he chose to. Uh, and that's something to be grateful for because it's just pure matter of grace that he did it. Yep. Amen. And then finally, uh, he said, the Bible says God is in heaven throughout the Old and New Testament. Is the simple God in heaven creation in your uh, in your well, view? It, it all it also says that he fills the heaven and earth, right? Yeah. So, he's everywhere. He's omnipresent. That's yeah, yeah. That's omni cool. omnipresent means he's not confined to yep. any space and time. So he can be in multiple places at the same time. Not in the sense that we are, where we're confined to a certain locality, as if his essence is encapsulated by a specific place. Otherwise, you'd have to say the same thing about earth, because the Bible says that as well. That he fills not just heaven but earth as well. He's in heaven certainly in a special sense, right? Scripture makes that clear. He, he makes his special presence known in a unique way that's beyond what really we have too much of a right to pry into, um, except that it's the full manifestation of his glory before his adoring angels. Um, but what we have to hold with that is that he's not confined to a physical place. He's not constrained by it. He's He transcends it. Uh, and if he didn't, he couldn't fill earth as well at the same time. So the Bible makes it very clear he's not confined to heaven in that kind of way, like we're confined to a room. Yep. Take all of Scripture together. Don't just look at the one passage where it talks about him being yes. in heaven. Look at where he says he's in earth, too. Yep. What that means. Absolutely. So, Hudson, hopefully that uh, answers your questions. And thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate it. All right. Well, I think that's all we have for today. Another long one, but hopefully this has been helpful and beneficial. Next week, we'll be talking about Christian nationalism, another uh, touchy topic. And Andrew will be joining me as well, and we'll be discussing that. So everyone have a great rest of your weekend. And Lord willing, we will see you guys bye next bye. week. And Taya is already sneaking in here to try and uh, pull me away from here. So let's watch Dragon Ball. <laughs> No, All right, I'm going to close You're up. Gonna get yourself okay. in a bunch this of is what happens when you do a talk <laughs> for kids uh, surrounding you. So. Hi, Uncle Andrew. <laughs> Hi, Dave. All right, everyone have a they great are, weekend. And take now care. our nepotism is